can please stand for the Lord's uh, reading of His book this morning, Luke chapter 14. We're going to read Luke chapter 14, verse 15, and on down to about verse 34, 35. Luke 14 says, uh, 15 down, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, or invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuses. They first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, Hey, I have bought five yoke of oxen, I go to prove them. I pray thee, I have excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things, and the master of the house began, or being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, Bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. The servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. There went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man comes to me and hates not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and brethren and sisters, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever doeth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intended to build a tower, sitteth not down first, count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. What king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first, consulted whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Amen. You may be seated. Well, the Lord God has gives us a pretty healthy dose of a mouthful here. And simply put, throughout this whole passage of Scripture, the Lord Jesus is doing this. He's asking us, commanding us, Telling us, count the cost. Count the cost, right? Back in verse 15 of Luke chapter 14, he says this. When one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and invited many. The kingdom of God, the supper being mentioned here, is the marriage supper of the Lamb mentioned in Revelation chapter 19, verse 19. Blessed is he that will partake in this supper. Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman that will partake in the marriage supper of the Lamb. It will be a blessed people. It will be in God's kingdom. Remember when the Lord's speaking this, He's got one heck of a crowd around Him. People are drawn to Him. We know why we've talked about it in the past. He's got a great many people around him, and he's about to tighten down the nut, if you will, just a little bit. He's about to thin out the crowd. Right? He's about to thin the crowd out a little bit, and we'll get to that point here 
a little ways down, but he's about to thin the crowd. He knows he's God that many have showed up not for the right reason. He's going to thin them out. I mean, honestly, I mean, come on. I mean, in, in today's world, in today's standards, and even in the past, I mean, what preacher would not enjoy a crowd coming to see him preach, right? Coming to see what he had to say. But the Lord Jesus is different. He doesn't desire the big crowds. He desires the heart of man, right? He wants to see what's in the heart of man. He goes down deep. He, he'll eventually get to the point to where he's going to open up man's heart to see what he truly thinks and who he truly is. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. He can easily say, he can easily look at it as this, the Lord God has made a great supper and He's invited many. He sent His servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are ready. Everything has been done. Can we not look at it as Jesus' birth, His, His moving, His announcement of who He is. His proclamation of being the Redeemer of the world. His death, His, His burial, His resurrection, all is complete. The work of Christ is complete. Now let us come and let us join in what He has done. Let's enjoy what He has done. Everything is ready. The invitation is gone out. We talked a little bit about this this morning in Sunday school class. I think Justin made mention of it. You talk to somebody and you tell them about the glory of Christ, the glory of eternal life. You tell them about what's coming, the glory to those who believe, right? But oh, for most, there's one common thread. It's not what type of excuse, it's the excuse, right? <clears throat> but they all with one consent began to make an excuse. The common thread runs through all fallen mankind, it's an excuse, right? As to why he or she can't come to faith in the one true living God. We talked this morning in Sunday school class again. They live this life as this, this life will always be. Right? Amen. They live as this, this life will always be. They, they don't understand that this life is but a mere vapor. It comes and goes. It, it doesn't last long. We make great plans, don't we, for the future. We make investment plans. We make vacation plans. We make plans of education. We make plans for children. We make plans for grandchildren. Boy, we make so many plans for a life that really is but a vapor. Isn't it? And they with one excuse began, or with one consent, they began to make excuses. That's how it is, isn't it? Excuse after excuse after excuse. The first one said unto him, Hey, I bought a piece of ground and, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. In other words, this. Hey, I've... I've I'm preoccupied with the things of this world. The material things. Preoccupied with the material things of this world. I've got to tend to that. Right? Even after the, pro the proclamation of there's coming a marriage supper, there's coming where you can sit and you can feast with the Redeemer of the world, there's those group, there's that group that says what? I'm so consumed with the things of this world. Consumed with it. 
The first says, I've bought a piece of ground and, I, and I've got to go tend to it. Maybe next time. Maybe invite me next time. Kind of like when you invite somebody out to dinner or somebody invites you out to dinner and you've got a lot of things going and you can't make it. And you always say, most times you'll say, well, maybe next time. And you'll hear them say, maybe next time. That's what this, that's what this guy is saying. He's saying, maybe next time. Maybe next time. Preoccupied with material things. The neglect of salvation. The neglect of salvation that only comes through the one true living God. Live this life as if this life will always be. To us that believe, it's, it's foolishness to think that way. But remember, you too lived the life of the unbeliever. You were there. You were there when you made the excuse after excuse after excuse. You were there. You were there when you come up with excuse after excuse, and boy, you can come up with the best of them, couldn't you? But yet another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Another says, What? I'm occupied. I'm occupied with my job. I'm occupied with, with rewards, my, my, my business engagements, right? Even the believer, when it comes to worship, I'm occupied. I'm occupied for what's in it for me. Be very careful. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, as we move down through here, is going to unload on us very, very hard. Yes. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Isn't it funny? How even a family member can keep you from coming to Christ. Even a family member can keep you from coming to church. Yes. Justin said that in Sunday school class this morning. He said, J.C. is 10 pound little idol, right Justin? When she was little, a newborn would keep them from church. Isn't it funny how that works? We all struggle with it, don't we? We all do. But here he's talking about, hey, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. In other words, I have the cares of my family and, and I can't come to you. I don't want to serve you. I don't want to come in faith. I've got my family to take care of. You ever had people tell you that before? Something as great as his salvation, they say, I've got something to do with my family and I don't want to hear about what you have to say. Sounds silly, but it's true, isn't it? So the servant came and he showed his Lord these things. He told the Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, it's as if God, he gets angry, and he says to his servant, then go out quickly into the streets and to the lanes of the city and bring in the poor, bring in the maimed, bring in the crippled, bring them in, bring the blind in. Bring somebody in. Amen. Go tell somebody. Dude, you can look at it as if maybe he was talking about Israel. Oh, unbelieving Israel. Oh, the higher ups of unbelieving Israel. Right? Amen. They would not believe. This is a universal call, we know, a universal opportunity. The master says, well then go out, go out to, go out to the lowest of the low and call them. Right? Bring them. If you move on down into Luke chapter 15, verse 2, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured and said, this man what? This man receives sinners and eats with them. How dare 
dare he eat with sinners? How dare he eat with filthy, stinking, rotten, lame, leprosy people? How dare he eat with low caste? How dare he eat with the homeless? How dare he eat today? How dare he stop and talk to the man or woman laying on the bench? How dare you? But be careful. You might not say those words, but you might think them in your mind. When you drive by and you take a gander at the person laying on a bench and you do nothing. You look at them and you're like, ah, oh, too bad for them. Is that not how the Pharisees acted? Of course they did. Amen. Too bad for them. Too bad for he or too bad for she. You know, too bad for them. And that's what the Lord's saying here. He says, then go out quickly into the streets and into the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and, and the crippled, the halt, and, 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 and bring the blind in. Bring them to me. Call them. Tell them about who I am. Tell them about my grace. Tell them that redemption only lies within me. Tell them. If the higher ups won't hear it, if, if the man who's all sophisticated and got married and got his life in line, if he won't hear it, then tell somebody else. Amen. If the man who's got money to buy many oxen and many and many cattle, if he doesn't listen, then tell somebody else. Amen. Just tell somebody about the marriage supper that awaits all who would believe. In Luke chapter 7, verse 36 on down, we looked at this in the past. I think it was maybe at the Thanksgiving service that night, but it, it, it bears looking at it again. Luke chapter 7, verse 36, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to meet. Remember, behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat, or sat down to eat at the Pharisee's house. Remember, she brought in an alabaster box of ointment. Remember that? We looked at that in the past. She brought in a very expensive kind of of, of, of marble box it held a very expensive perfume and she stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with, with her tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and, and kissed his feet and anointed them with, with ointment this is who the Lord Jesus is saying go to isn't it The rich won't hear you. He says, go to the poor. She kisses his feet and anoints his feet with, with ointment. It's as if she's broken, broken, devastated over her sin. She makes her way through the crowd, remember? She makes her way through this crowd of people. How dare she? Remember, how dare you are there? How dare you filthy, stinking, rotten, smelly sinner? How dare you? Now, when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, If this man were a prophet, he would have known what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. She never even spoke a word up to this point. Remember also that it was very, very, very not like women to let their hair down at this point in time. They kept it pinned up. Not in public, you never did it. But it says that somewhere along the line, remember she pulls the pins, she takes her hair, she doesn't care what people think, and she starts to wipe his feet with her tears and the ointment. She is devastated over her sin. Jesus answers and says unto him, Simon, I have something to say unto thee. And the master say on. And, and there was a certain creditor which had two debts, 
One owed 500 pence, the other 50, and when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? Simon answered and says, I suppose he to whom that's forgiven most. And he said unto him, you're judging pretty good, you judged rightly. He turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest this woman, I enter into thy house. Thou gave me no water for my feet, but she has done nothing but wash my feet with her tears. She's wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, Simon. But this woman, since the time I came in, has done nothing, has not ceased but to kiss my what? My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Simon, you didn't even anoint me with oil of any kind, but she has anointed me with the costly of oil as she possibly could. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, her sins, Simon, are many. but are forgiven. For she loves me much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same will love little, Simon. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. In other words, you, my daughter, you, my sister, will sit with me at the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's going to be a place for you, young lady. You know you, the sinful one. You that found herself in so much sin, there is going to be a place reserved for you at the table. Just for you. It's going to be your seat. And they that sat at meat with them began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgives sins also? Still didn't get it, did they? Still didn't get it. And he said unto woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Live your life of a vapor because one day you will be in my presence forever and you will sit at the table also. What a joy! joy you know, I gotta wonder sometimes what in the world was going through Simon's mind after that happened see this is what he meant by in verse 21 of Luke chapter 14 then go out quickly to the streets and to the lanes of the city bring in either the poor bring the cool poor in Go tell the prostitutes. Right? Go tell them about my grace. Go tell the ones who haven't taken a bath in five years. Go tell them about my grace. Bring them in. Bring the crippled. Bring the lame. Bring the blind. Tell them about me. And this is, the, this is awesome in verse 22. And the servant says, Lord, it is done as you have commanded. But yet, Lord, there's still room at the table. Think about that. What's he saying? The servant says, Lord, we've told people. And there's still room. You ever hear the saying there's a room at the cross? You guys always have heard that plenty of times. Room at the cross. Here the servant says there's room at the table, Lord. There's room for one more. Right? One more. That should be your mentality in your life. When you tell somebody about Christ, your mentality should be if I can just tell one more. Right? If I can just tell one more. 
If I could just tell one more about the glory of Christ. There's one more. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Tell them to come in to me. Tell them about who I am, for I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. It's as if he said, Israel will be cut off for their unbelief. Man will be cut off. Those who refuse to believe. But here's the turning point. Here's the turning point. See, up to this point, this is you think, man, this is great. Salvation, salvation, salvation. And it is great. Salvation, there's room at the table. The Lord's called those who would come. Come now, there's still room. There's still room at the cross. There's still room at the table. The marriage supper left. Come while you still can. The evangelist is yelling, come while you still can. There's still room at the table. Come. But listen to what the Lord Jesus does. And man, he hammers hard. I'm telling you, he does. He says, and there went a great multitude with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man comes to me and hates not his father, mother, wife, Children, brethren, sisters, yea, his own life, he cannot be what? My disciple. Now he starts to call the herd. He starts to thin the pack. He's starting to thin them out. See, what do you mean by hate? He's saying this. He's saying, when you come to me, you come to me and nothing, nothing supersedes me. That is true salvation, he says. He says nothing. Your mother doesn't come before me. Your father doesn't come before me. Your family doesn't come before me. Your fiancé, your brothers, your sisters, nothing comes before me. I come first in all things. And if you can't have it that way, then you can't be my disciple. Amen. Oh my goodness. He did not just say that. Amen. That's what he said. You see, most, most would be very, very content. Most would be very content in understanding and seeing as, a, as, as, as an evangelist, as a preacher. Hey, look at the crowd. Look at the people that have come. And they would cut it short. But Jesus says, listen, no, you better count the cost when it comes to sitting at my table. He says, you better count the cost because it's going to cost you. It might cost you everything, he says. There might be a few of you who understand what I, what I mean. They're costing you maybe family members, close friends. There's some people when they come to the Lord Jesus Christ, it immediately splits. It causes a rift within the family. Doesn't it? It causes a rift between friendships. Doesn't it? Even sometimes when the word is proclaimed from the pulpit, it causes a rift within the congregation because they don't like what is being said. And it bothers them. So they figure out a way to get rid of that guy and put in somebody else that's going to make them feel good. Take some time, but they'll figure out a way. Don't they? See, that's what Jesus is saying. He says, listen, he says, this is all fine and dandy. There's plenty of room, but understand, plenty of room at the table, but understand, this comes with a cost. He says, I'll give you an invitation, but understand, there's going to be a cost. And the cost doesn't have anything to do with, with kneeling down and praying some 
simple man-made prayer or signing some goofy card. He says, listen, the cost means that I am priority number one. And if it can't be that way, then don't even fool yourself into thinking you can be one of my children. Because it's not going to happen. You might walk out of here thinking you are. He said, but one day you will realize that you never were. Hard, isn't it? Hard. That's what he means, he says in verse verse 27. And whosoever doeth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be what? My disciple. He says, listen, whoever cannot abandon himself and understand the sacrifice of coming to Jesus cannot be my disciple. He says, if you can't abandon yourself and and come to me wholly and solely, 100%, then don't even call yourself a follower of me because you're not. Dear gracious, man. I mean, Lord, let up on them a little bit, right? Right? But that's how it is. But in our humanness, in our human mind, we don't like that, do we? Because we want our toys too. And what I mean by toys is sin. We want the sins of our flesh too. And the Lord says, no, you can't have that. You say, what do you do when you struggle with sin? Well, you you struggle with sin. And true believers, when they struggle with sin, we all do. It aches us, it bothers us, tears us up inside. Does it? When you got to start to question who you are is when you can waller and play and sin day after day after day after day after day after day, and it doesn't even bother you. When you hear God's word proclaimed, it doesn't even affect you. John Stout said this, and he said this in 1978. The Christian landscape is strewn with the wreckage of derelict, half-built towers. The ruins of those who began to build and were unable to finish. For thousands of people still ignore Christ's warning, undertake to follow Him without first pausing to reflect of the cost in doing so. The result is the greatest scandal of Christendom today, so-called nominal Christianity. In countries to which Christian civilization has spread, large numbers of people have covered themselves with, with a decent but thin veneer of Christianity. They've allowed themselves to become somewhat involved, enough to be respectable, but not enough to be uncomfortable. Their religion is a great soft cushion. It protects them from their hard unpleasantness of life while changing its place and shape to suit their convenience. No wonder the cynics speak of hypocrites in the, in the church and dismiss religion as escapism. That was penned down in 1978. 40 some years ago. What would that guy say today? Think about that. He's right. The landscape of Christendom is is scattered with remnants of those who called themselves Christian. He's making a mention about verse 28 on down in Luke chapter 14. And Jesus says this. Jesus says, okay, if you don't understand what I mean by counting the cost, which of you intended to build a tower sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he has sufficient enough to finish it. Right? We get it. We understand. We're out there in the back. Right? We're doing something to the drive, to the, to the parking lot down here. You measure. You figure out, okay, what's it going to take to finish this beast? What's it going to take to do it? How much concrete is it going to take? How much money is it going to take? Jesus says, okay, let me just, let's just, do, if you're going to build a tower, and, and this day and time there's a few towers that were thought of. There's towers of protection. There's a few towers that, that went away around certain cities so they can understand what he was trying to say. They can get it. For which of you intends to build a tower? It sits not down first and counts the cost, whether it has sufficient to finish it. Lest happily after he has laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that is behold begin to mock him. In other words, of course you're going to sit there and figure out what it's going to take, because you don't want to look like a dummy when it's all said and done, and everybody's sitting around saying, well, he built half the tower, he ain't completed all because he run out of money. Who wants to be that one? 
saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying this. He's saying, listen, before you come to me, before you give me the nod, before you say to me, Lord, I'll follow you, you better count the cost. You better count the cost. It was the last time you heard an evangelist say when he was up there speaking, proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in an evangelistic manner. When's the last time you heard him say at the end of the service, hey, before, before you even come, count the cost. When's the last time? I've never heard it said. Never. Have I heard an evangelist stand up and say, before you come, you need to count the cost of what it's going to take to follow this Lord. You see, they stop at verse 24. It's convenient. It's not cutting. Well, what king going to make war against another king sits not down first and consults whether he be able to 10,000 or with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while yet the others are great way off, he sends an ambassador and desires conditions of what? Peace, right? Peace. You see, listen, sooner or later, the test of your faith will come. Not the test of man, but God's test. Sooner or later, the test will show up. You can sit there and you can call yourself a Christian all you want this morning. I can sit here and call myself a Christian, stand here and call myself a Christian all I want. But sooner or later, the test will come into my life that proves who I am, whether I'm in or whether I am out. Well, of course it does. Of course it does. It comes to us all. See, but we've titled the landscape that's strewn with so-called Christians. We've titled them nominal Christians today or however you want to look at it. And Jesus basically says, listen, you better count the cost before you truly come to me. You better count the cost because it might cost you everything. Men and women in the past, and I'm sure still today, some men and women today, but many women, men and women in the past, it seems exhausted themselves for the gospel. Exhausted themselves. They gave it all they had, didn't they? Wide open for the cause of Christ. Let us be wide open for the cause of Christ. You need rest, take rest, but then go back to serving. Even Jesus took rest from proclaiming the truth. Didn't get much of it. Seems like wherever he went, they'd find him. But he took rest. So likewise, whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. There it is, verse 33, the Lord Jesus Christ stands up and he turns to the massive crowd. A massive crowd has followed him. Maybe hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know. But there's a massive crowd we know of that is mentioned before this passage of Scripture. And he turns to them and he says, Listen, if you are not willing to leave everything you have, you cannot be my disciple. Just stay seated. Just stay seated. That's what he said. This is not my words. These are Christ's words. He said, if you cannot forsake everything, if you are not willing to leave everything for me, you cannot be for me. You never will. You'll just play the game. The game of Christian for 40, 50, 60 years or however long it goes. 
See what he's saying? Is he telling us to leave our spouse and follow him? No, he never goes against his own words. He never goes against his own truth. He's just saying this. You must be willing to place him above everything. And that's the interesting thing about being married is when he calls you, he calls the wife. When he calls the wife, he calls the husband. Amen. There's never a conflict of interest there when it comes to serving the truth. turns and he says be willing to leave all for me see there's a cost of true religion there's a cost of truly following Christ you've got example after example after example in scripture what happened to Paul Saul when he come to faith immediately he left what his old life what happened to the disciples when Jesus walked by and he said, follow me? There was a time when they would find themselves leaving their old lives and following him. What happened to the rich young ruler? Somebody mentioned the rich young ruler here this morning in Sunday school class. What happened to the rich young ruler? Lord, 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 how may I inherit eternal life? Basically, keep the commandments. I've kept all the commandments, okay? Then give everything you've got up and follow me and you can be my disciple. I can't do that. And what was Jesus' reply? And you can't be my disciple. You can't be my disciple. You're not one of mine. You look good. You've kept the commandments. You, you, I mean, we know he didn't truly. Okay. Jesus said, okay, let's say you've kept the commandments. But you can't give it up to follow me. You still enjoy the life that you live and you're not willing to follow me. You're not willing. You've counted the cost and you've seen that the cost was too much. Right? You count at the cost and you see it's too much. Kind of like when you build something at home or do something at home with your own money, you'll count the cost. Whoa, honey, I can't do this. We can't do this. It's too much. So you just don't do it. Or you cut it down half of what you're going to do. But in serving Christ and coming to Jesus Christ in faith, okay, there's no halfway coming. I can build something halfway at the house all day long. Okay, I got 5000 to build this. Okay, it takes 10000 Well, I'm just going to build it halfway and build a little bit on it later on. Okay, that's fine and dandy. But you can't do that when it comes to serving Jesus Christ. Either you come in solely for salvation 100% or you don't. See, halfway is called playing church. That's what it's called. It's called playing church. John MacArthur preached a sermon in the early 1970s, one of the very first sermons he ever preached in the church, Grace Community Church in California, titled How to Place Church and Preach for an Hour and a Half, and Half the Church Left. Half the Church Left. So, what today he's known throughout the world by millions. Why? Because he stayed the course. He stayed the course. Look at your life. There's many different ways you can go this morning with this passage of Scripture. But this is the way we're going to go this morning as we close. Look at your life. Are you truly His? Did you count the cost? Are you truly His? If He was to ask you to follow Him into something that maybe cost you a lot, would you do it? Would you do it? Would you willingly give up your job and follow Him somewhere? Or would you say, no, nah, that ain't happening. I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at. I've known several people that have walked away from well-paying jobs to go serve the Lord. When other members in the church said this, can you believe he or she did that? They are absolutely crazy. There's no way I would do that. What? Well, maybe because they're in and you're still outside looking in. Thinking you're in, but really you're out. I don't know. This is a hard truth, isn't it? But Jesus, when he preached the truth, eventually he got down to the hard stuff. Like we said about the rich young ruler, he could have easily, easily 
have assured that guy he was in. But he made it for so difficult for him, didn't he? He said, you got to give it all up, buddy, before you're my disciple. Easy to come. But when it truly means something, you've got to give it all up to follow me. For you truly cannot be one of mine. Amen. Cutting, isn't it? It was to me. Let's pray. Father, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for your truth. The truth is clear. It's powerful. But Lord, it cuts the gr against the grain of our minds. Especially in our culture today, Lord, in which we've been so programmed to think that all we have to do is believe and, and, and give up nothing. But you say, oh, you must believe. But you must also be willing, if called upon, to give it all up to follow me to count the cost of what it is to be one of my children Lord in a world in our society today that is so filled with vast materialism and vast accumulation of worldly stuff it's so difficult for people to give it up it's difficult Lord, you're telling us here this morning that there's no room in your church for half-hearted Christianity. It's all or nothing. Difficult for us to comprehend, but true. It's all or nothing. Use this church, use us as individuals for your glory and honor, Lord. Fill these pews. In a time when our society, when our nation needs to hear truth, Lord, we pray that the truth goes out. We pray that the truth goes out in other churches from men that are willing to proclaim the truth, Lord. And Lord, we pray that if the men are not willing to proclaim the truth, that you just move them out of the way. Do away with them. Because all they're doing is hindering the gospel. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. May you be glorified and honored this coming week. May you be magnified. Bring us back again this evening, Lord, to look upon your word. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.